All right, good morning, everyone. Just a couple of bookkeeping items before we get into the lecture. Uh, I sent an email out this morning. Hopefully, you got it. Um, apologies, there were still some permissions issues with the homework five folder that I created. That should be good to go. Uh, but if you can test it now or later and you find otherwise, let me know. Yeah. Are the files still the same? Yeah. Uh, well, um, the BAM files have been updated. I actually put new ones in there as well. Uh, so that, that's the, that gets at the other issue. Um, I messed up the BAM files. They didn't work the way as expected in the homework, so I've, I've fixed that. And given the complexities that I created, um, I'm going to extend the uh, homework deadline to not next Thursday, but the Tuesday afterwards, so you have some time to, what would that be, March 2, March 3, something like that. Okay, um, so today's, today's lecture is going to focus on a different type of genetic variation that I've alluded to in previous lectures, but we haven't talk and, talked about in great detail. Uh, and that's copy number variation, or structural variation, or, or more generally just variation in the structure of genomes from individual to individual. Um, and, you know, setting the stage, we, we've talked about this, this challenge we face in finding genetic variation in a massive genome that is six billion uh, nucleotides long, given the two parental haploid genomes. And we're typic we typically think about searches for genetic variation in the context of disease uh, in cases like this, where we're looking for single nucleotide differences that are present in one individual versus the other. Um, but, and, and, and so that's really been the dogma since really the 90s and early 2000s is that the vast majority of variability in human phenotype is driven by genetic variation at the single nucle nucleotide level. Um, so early studies such as the HapMap project um, and early microarrays were really going after trying to figure out where these single nucleotide differences were and characterizing um, the degree of variability at, at these known so-called polymorphic sites. So even today, there's things called SNP arrays. Has anyone ever used a SNP array? Um, SNP arrays are basically, they're looking at um, roughly a million known polymorphic sites in the human genome that are roughly evenly spaced along the genome. So it's, I, I like to think of it as, you know, the genome being in the in, interstate 80 that goes across the entire United States, there's a SNP that's tested at every mile marker. And that, that SNP that is tested is a sort of a proxy for the genetic variation that's, that's nearby in the genome. Um, but soon after the, the draft of the, the human genome first came out, um, work began to look for other forms of genetic variation. I think the, the earliest example that I'm most familiar with is some work from Jeff Bailey and Evan Eichler. Um, this is when Evan Eichler was at Case Western. And they did something that I think is pretty clever. They took the nucleotide sequence from each human chromosome and aligned each chromosome to itself and to every other chromosome. And what that allows it to do, if you remember back to the Smith-Waterman algorithm that we talked about, essentially they, they ended up with a matrix, like the Smith-Waterman matrix, that was chromosome in length. And every time there was a match, they would, they would fill in a, an X or a dot in this matrix. So this is what we're looking at right now is a dot plot. And every, every time there's a match, you get a dot. So since we're aligning the same one chromosome to itself, you would expect that you have a perfect match on the diagonal, right? Because you're aligning a sequence to itself it does exactly match itself on the diagonal. But what Bailey and Eichler were seeing is that off diagonal, in these red dots, there were lots of apparent duplications and deletions and inversions, large scale duplications, deletions and inversions, even within the same chromosome. And that suggested that th this is getting at 
the repetitiveness of the human genome, we already knew, we already know so far that the human genome is comprised of lots of different repeats um, from viral insertions and all sorts of other things. But what Eichler and Bailey were seeing is that these large-scale duplications and deletions were actually from very large sequence that's much larger than uh, transposon insertions and things like that. And so these were called termed segmental duplications or also known as low copy repeats. And what their, their paper basically concluded is that at least 5% of the genome it has these big segmental duplications that are not caused by um, retrotransposition. And this was sort of the first hint at the, the variability in copy number among uh, individuals, human individuals. But we actually already knew that the human genome um, has, is, has copy number variability. Even going back to the 40s and all the way through the 80s, basic cytogenetics and karyotyping methods, we knew about aneuploidy. We knew about sex chromosome anomalies. Those are essentially really big copy number differences. Trisomy 21 is an extra copy of the entire uh, chromosome 21, right? Um, and so our understanding of the degree uh, and, and location and type of structural variation, as is the case with most things in genomics, is really driven by uh, innovations in technology. So in the 90s, we had uh, comparative genomic hybridization techniques, fish, sky, cobra, lots of different ways of essentially painting chromosomes so you could actually see um, variation in structure and copy number. Um, after the the creation of the first human reference genome, we could then, since we knew the nucleotide sequence, we could then design oligonucleotide probes to assay um, that genomic region and in multiple individuals. And if you take DNA from one individual and another individual, you hybridize their DNA to a particular probe for a given part of, say, chromosome 17. If the two individuals have the same copy number at that locus, the intensity, the relative intensity will be the same. But if one individual has twice as much DNA as the other one, you'll have a, a biased ratio towards that other individual. So these types of genomic microarrays were used to, to detect um, copy number variation. Some of the early studies um, describing the, the extent of copy number variation in the human genome were based upon these, these uh, genomic microarray technologies. Fast forward to today, we basically do this now with whole, whole genome sequencing or whole exome sequencing, um, basically because the resolution is much higher than any of these techniques. So this, this technique had very low resolution, basically chromosome level. This would allow us to see multi-megabase copy number variation. This is getting down to maybe tens of kilobases, and now we can see detect structural variants that are as small as 50 base pairs with direct sequencing of entire genomes. Uh, and, and so, I think somewhat surprisingly, um, in 2007, the science breakthrough of the year was human genetic variation, which um, even as a fairly green graduate student at the time, I was a bit surprised by that being the breakthrough. But actually, the contents of this issue are three papers that focused on the extent of copy number variation in the human genome. So what they really mean is we knew a lot about genetic variation in the human genome from SNPs, but the, the insight here was, gee, there's actually a lot of copy number variability um, among individuals as well. Those two papers were, were fairly small in scale by today's standards. Um, oh, actually, these are papers that preceded that 2007 paper. This is sort of the, the, the first couple papers in this area. Um, the first found, looked at 20 individuals, and they found 76 copy number variants. So the bar was fairly low back then. You could basically just look at a few individuals and, and have, a, have a, what, a science paper that said, hey, there's, we found 76 things. Here's a, here's a table that reports them. Um, and, but I think the, the interesting thing is that these copy number variants that they could detect among 20 individuals, if they could find them in 20 individuals, they have to be fairly common. They affected 70, 70 different genes in the human genome. So this was starting to help the community appreciate the fact that these copy number changes, deletions, and duplications um, could affect protein coding genes, right? And so therefore, they could possibly affect phenotypic variability among individuals. 
The second paper was slightly la larger in scale, but you know, 50 or 255 CNV is affecting another 127 genes. What they found is that these copy number variants were located near regions where Eichler and Bailey saw those big segmental duplications that we saw in the dot plot. And the reason for that is a, is a mechanism called non-allelic homologous recombination. Uh, in model organisms, this is often referred to as ectopic recombination. As in many things in human genomics, it's sort of rebranded or returned. But the idea is, during meiosis, you, we have uh, alignment of homologous chromosomes so that when crossovers occur in recombination, we're actually exchanging allelic DNA, the same DNA from the same locus. But if there's a repeat here, that's very similar to a repeat here on a chromosome, you can sometimes have misalignment such that copy A is aligned with copy A prime on the homolog. And now what you get is crossover because of that homologous pairing, but it's actually not the same alleles on the chromosome. So you can, when you have crossover like that between these two um, similar repeats, the resulting um, haploid products will be either a duplication and a deletion because of that non-allelic uh, alignment. Okay. So these duplications and deletions that they found among these individuals coincided with these segmental duplications that drive that ectopic recombination during meiosis. So a lot of these, a lot of um, chromosome um, 16, the PRM of chromosome 16, I forget which band, it's littered with segmental duplications and there's lots of copy number variability, deletions and duplications in the human genome and actually some of those loci lead to developmental disorders because these are happening spontaneously during um, gamete production. Okay, so let's just talk a little bit about the, the type of structural variation that exists in the human genome. I like to think of an analogy to every, every one of us, our genome being, um, say, a copy of the book Moby Dick. Um, some of us, copy number variation would manifest as some of us might have two copies of chapter 7. Some of us might have uh, the third paragraph of chapter 19 deleted. Some of us might have... Um, all of chapter 20 completely inverted so that the last sentence is first and that the first sentence is last. So all of those things can happen uh, in the human genome. We've got deletions, you know, a whole segment of DNA is deleted in this individual's chromosome with respect to the reference. We can have insertions like mobile elements can um, jump and insert in, in, in the human genome. Duplications of the segment B, inversions, translocations, all sorts of things. Um, and we've known about these forever. I mean, going all the way back for mobile elements, going all the way back to, to Barbara McClintock's work, we knew about so-called jumping genes in maize. Those were transposons. Okay. I have a question. Yes. So is there like a difference between an SNP insertion and like a structural variation insertion? Is it just like the size or? Right. So you're talking about a, a, a small indel. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So... That's a great question because it's, it's kind of a moving target. Operationally, people think about structural variants as being things being 50 base pairs or larger, but why is it not 49? Why is it not 47? Um, I distinguish the two based upon the mechanism that creates uh, these types of changes. So it, small insertion deletion changes are typically caused by replication slippage, but larger duplications and deletions are caused by mechanisms such as ectopic recombination. When double-stranded DNA breaks occur, you have non-homologous end joining, which, you know, the cell's like, oh crap, we have double-stranded break, we gotta, get, we gotta fix this, else die. Um, and so it does everything to stitch things together, even if it re requires chewing back DNA to lead to a deletion. Um, 50 base pairs, I, I would argue, maybe isn't the best threshold to distinguish me mechanisms. So the other part of why 50 base pairs is kind of the limit is, is a bit driven by the sequencing technologies that we use to detect structural variation. So there's a bit of a bias in terms of what we can detect. Does that help? Yeah. Good. Right. Um, so I did my entire postdoc working on methods to detect 
structural variation and spent a couple years um, characterizing all the structural variation that exists in different lab mouse strains. Um, and when I gave talks up on this topic then, and it still happens, people still question, like, why do we care about these things? Um, if, if there's four million SNP differences between any two people in this room, but there's only a couple thousand copy number changes, why do we care? Well, a couple of reasons why I think we all should care. Um, first is that while small in number, these copy number changes are big. They're often quite big. So the total number of base pairs affected by the copy number variants in your genome is larger than the total number of base pairs affected by all the SNPs in your genome. Um, so if you're interested in phenotype, things that duplicate or delete entire genes, they're probably relevant. Um, even if they duplicate or delete regulatory elements, it probably affects gene expression. And in fact, copy number variants are the strongest expression quantitative, quantitative trait loci in the human genome, EQTLs, if you do this work. So there's a nice paper from Colby Chang a couple years ago showing that common structural variants upstream of transcription start sites have a much bigger effect on the expression of, of downstream genes than, than single nucleotide changes. Another piece, uh, another reason why they're, they're relevant is um, genome evolution or speciation. So if you have a large inversion on an that you know, occupies the bulk of a, of a chromosome arm, that prevents homologous pairing with a chromosome that doesn't have that inversion. It suppresses pairing and suppresses recombination, and that suppression can lead to speciation in spe uh, sexually reproducing uh, organisms. So structural variation really is a, sometimes a catalyst for speciation events. If you're interested in cancer genomics, you probably know that a hallmark of pretty much every solid tumor genome is that it's littered with copy number and structural rearrangement. Um, I did some work looking at uh, uh, an advanced breast cancer genome a couple years ago and was just absolutely shocked at the that, it's, that it was even like remotely a human genome anymore. It was just so rearranged and mangled. Um, and that's partly because uh, these, these tumor cells are um, proliferating and um, you know, the typical mechanisms that suppress or would try to uh, uh, lead to apoptosis are suppressed in these cells. And so these, these large-scale rearrangements that would die off in a cell population in a normal context proliferate uh, in a tumor context. Um, they're also relevant, they underlie many different neuropsychiatric disorders. I talked about gene dosage effects. If you have a duplication or deletion, you're going to increase the copy number or decrease the copy number of genes, which could uh, affect phenotype. Um, and they also are, many develop, uh, severe developmental disorders are caused by um, spontaneous copy number changes, usually deletions in um, developing embryos. Um, you probably know a little bit. I don't, sadly, I was talking to my kids about this the other night. I actually have no idea what my blood type is, which is really sad. Um, so I'm kind of curious. I, I, and I went and looked at my 23andMe data, and I don't think it tells me my blood type either, which it, I think should be able to know. But does anybody, do you, how many of you know your blood type? Okay, D do you, everyone knows the negative or positive part? Okay, where does that come from? What's the negative and positive? All right, well, what's our age? It's a rhesus factor, right? So it's this gene, RHD, that is your rhesus factor. And the positive or negative is whether or not you have a deletion or not a deletion at that rhesus factor locus. So that's a copy number variant that distinguishes the blood type uh, for, for pretty much all of us. Um, copy number variation in this, in this gene that I don't know much about. Um, is, a, is, is predictive of, of uh, severity of an HIV infection. Um, cytochromes, um, especially CYP2D6, really drive our ability, copy number variability in this gene, drive our ability to metabolize um, different drugs such as uh, painkillers and antipsychotics. Hypometabolizers metabolize this stuff very slowly, and that's driven by fewer copies of CYP2D6. 
Um, so probably people like Keith Richards and Ozzy Osbourne and stuff have like hundreds of copies of this gene. Um, and, and if you're a hyper metabolizer, you can, you know, you're over processing these drugs and you actually feel pain more quickly than others, right? So knowing the copy number of CYP2D6 and other cytochromes like it is actually important when potentially dosing individuals who might be hypersensitive or hyposensitive. All right, I'm beating a dead horse here, but um, there's a whole litany. There's many reviews on why copy number variation is important in human disease phenotypes. I won't belabor that point. Right. Um, What's really interesting to me from a, I'm not a developmental biologist, I sort of wish I were, um, but some of the really nice literature over the last few years has shown that copy number variants that affect these topically, topologically associated domains or TADs, everyone heard that jargon by now? So that's basically topologically associated domains are, you know, we think of, I've been talking about the genome as this linear thing. But really, when it's packed into the cell, obviously, it's, there's a double helix, and that's wrapped around histones. We have chromatin. It's all just jam-packed. So you can have very distally located um, DNA that interacts, that it's phys has physical proximity to things that are linearly way far away. And these topologically associated domains are, are merely um, loci that tend to be close together very often. So the way you do those experiments, there's probably newer techniques now, but the technique that I'm most familiar with is you essentially um, fix chromatin, and then you use paired-end sequencing to um, figure out, um, to, you, you fix the chromatin, and then you basically break the DNA in a way such that you can get um, paired-end sequences where the two ends that are close to one another physically, um, you can actually detect that with the sequencing. And so these, these heat maps are showing that um, you know, this locus and this locus are close together very often, even though linearly they're very far apart. Okay, okay, so connecting back to the developmental biology, the idea is that when you have these, these big triangles here, these are topologically associated domains, but the, these, these troughs are sort of boundaries, boundaries between these topologically associated domains. And this is a is not, this is, you can tell by the data that this isn't consistent in every cell. It's a probabilistic thing. Um, but the idea is that if you disrupt some of these topologically associated domain boundaries, that perturbs the regulation of genes that are downstream or nearby, that these, uh, that these TADs are, are um, helping to regulate. And that can lead to disruptions in the development um, caused by disruptions in, in the genes, the genes that those boundary elements um, and TADs are trying to regulate. So again, it doesn't have to be, copy number variation doesn't have to affect genes. It could affect large-scale regulatory elements that have a phenotypic consequence, in this case, uh, development. Um, Katie Pollard and a grad student from her lab last year, the year before, I guess it was two years ago, found that these, these chromatin structures and other features are actually conserved uh, across species and are intolerant of copy number changes compared to other loci in the genome. So if you delete these, these boundary elements, bad things happen, is the argument. OK, what we're going to transition into now is how do we go about finding these things? So I've talked about what they are what their consequences may be, why we hopefully should care about them, but how do we go about finding them with, with sequencing technologies? Okay, so in this case, we've got, the, the example is, this is the reference genome, and there's this, this DNA sequence in red that is present in the reference genome, but let's imagine that the, the, the reality is that that segment of DNA was deleted in my genome, which is the sample genome here. If we get a DNA sequencing read from my genome through some sequencing technology and align that sequencing read back to the reference genome, the alignment is, is going to, should, represent the fact that there's a deletion there. So what's going to happen is this first part of my sequence that is upstream of this deletion in the reference genome will align upstream of the deleted sequence. And then this novel junction in my genome, it's novel, because it's GGCC in my genome, 
but it was GG, TTTT, you know, et cetera, et cetera, then CC. So the novelty is this GCC is now paired up with this GG. So therefore, the downstream green sequence should allow a line downstream of the deleted sequence in the reference genome. That's the idea. If we get a sequence, in this case, one end of a paired end read, that fully contains that novel DNA junction. Okay? We can use those types of alignments, the, the patterns like this, to find all sorts of other rearrangements. Um, there's no need to, to walk through all these or no need to even um, memorize them or anything. But if you, if you refer back to this and you're interested in these things, this is, I, I think of this as like mental gymnastics of, okay, if this happened in this genome and you align it to the other genome, what, what kind of pattern are you going to get? Deletions, I think, are the easiest, right? Because you have this basically split alignment upstream and downstream of the deleted sequence. And insertion is really just the reciprocal of that. Um, if a sequence is inserted in my genome, it'll sort of look like the mirror image of that same, same pattern. Um, we can detect reciprocal translocations through more complicated means where there's going to be two breakpoints for the two different the scars that occur on, on each of the two chromosomes. Inversion, similarly, will create two scars because we have a, now a novel junction between C and G and D and H because in the reference genome, C was followed by D and G was followed by H. Now it's flipped around, so there's two scars that should be detectable in the sequencing data. Okay? We're not going to, we don't really need to care about all this, but the idea is that these are the types of patterns that um, software are looking for when they're trying to find structural rearrangements in a genome. So how do we find deletions of a chapter in the genome, duplications, aversions, et cetera, et cetera. All right, so let's get into some basic summary stats. Uh, uh, humans differ by roughly 3,000 um, deletions that are bigger than 500 base pairs. Here's an example of what a deletion might look like. This is actually from a mouse genome. This is something I found in, as a postdoc. Um, and what you can see, this is the predicted deletion by the software that was run. And the way it predicted that deletion is the fact that we have DNA sequencing coverage, lots of depth here, reflecting that this mouse was diploid from here to here. Then all of a sudden, there's no DNA sequencing coverage. And so this suggests that there's a copy, there's a what? A deletion or a duplication? Obviously a deletion. Is it a homozygous or a heterozygous deletion? Homozygous, because there's no, there's no sequencing data at all. If it was a he hemizygous or heterozygous deletion, you should expect to have coverage like maybe to here, and it would drop off, right? Because there's still one chromosome that doesn't have the, the deletion. The other piece that I just want to emphasize is that it's not well drawn on this figure, um, but these, there's all these alignments that have red pairs on upstream and downstream of this deletion. Those are actually paired end sequences that IGV flags as being where their ends are too far apart. So remember that paired end sequencing, we're trying to isolate molecules that are roughly the same size, so 500 base pair of molecules. So if the two ends align, say, 5,000 base pairs apart, that's very different than the expectation of 500. So it might be indicative of a deletion because the ends are too far apart. And if they align too far apart in the reference genome, that suggests that DNA that is in the reference genome was deleted in the individual's genome, leaving it uh, to the ends being too far apart. We'll come back to that in a second. But IGV helps us to find these things by flagging alignments that are too far apart. Humans differ by a few hundred duplications. So in this case, there's an um, a increase of one copy. So roughly diploid. And then all of a sudden, there's this increase in depth. So maybe this is individual's copy number three or copy number four, kind of hard to tell at this locus. This is the prediction by the software. And you can not only see this increase or pile up of uh, coverage reflecting the duplication, but you also see these aberrant alignments. Okay, And that's another signal for structural variance. Thanks, yeah. Uh, why does the depth increase? Because if you have more copies, wouldn't you sort of proportionally increase the read than it would say in depth zero? 
Okay, so let's say the reference genome has only one copy of um, a gene. But in your genome, there's a tandem duplication. But, yeah, so there's only one copy in the reference genome, so you have twice the information in your DNA sequences, so they all get piled up to that one locus in the, in the reference genome. And so that's what's happening here. Okay? Um, we, there's a few hundred inversions, and inversions are particularly interesting in the human genome. There's not many of them, but inversions, as I mentioned, can suppress recombination. So if you actually look at regions of the genome that have high, um, common inversions, you actually see, if you look at recombination rates across um, humans, those, those regions are suppressed for recombination because recombination just can't occur there if, if two individuals have different um, inversion states. Yeah? So if you're mapping uh, like a read and it's um, been inverted, do you need to say if you can do like a special flag on the mapping software? Is that just to just check the reverse complement? Yeah, so um, what happens is, so the expectation for a normal paradigm read that lacks an inversion is that sort of the upstream end will be aligning on the forward strand and the downstream end will align on the reverse strand. In the case of an inversion, this upstream breakpoint, so I remember I, met, I mentioned there's two scars, the ends will be plus plus, and then this downstream breakpoint, the ends will be minus minus. And that's, if you, if you go back to the DNA gymnastics here, you, you can kind of work it. I mean, it actually takes some time to work through why that is, but that, that's exactly the pattern that, um, that software would be looking for. There's thousands of uh, retrotransposon insertions that are polymorphic in the human genome. Um, a lot of them look like this, where the reference genome actually has the line element inserted in it. Um, whereas the individual doesn't have it. Now, there's a couple important things to note here. You can see this, this drop in coverage because it, it's like a deletion. Like that sequence is actually not in this individual's genome. It's in the reference genome. It's annotated right here. But mechanistically, it's not a deletion. Mechanistically, it was an insertion that is now polymorphic in the population, but when we align sequencing data from an individual that lacks that insertion, it looks like a deletion. Does that make sense? The other bit that's complicated is, well, wait, there's all this sequence here, and it's gray. It's a lighter gray than this dark gray. Now, I'm telling you that this is a line element. Any, anyone have any ideas about what these gray alignments might be, the lighter gray? Right, say again? Low quality. What type of quality? Poor mapping quality, yep, we're getting there. Why is it poor mapping quality? Right, because there are like, I don't know, many, many thousand line elements in the human genome that are very, very similar to this one. And so what the aligner is saying is, well, gee, this sequence could belong here, but it could also equally belong at any one of the other 10,000 line elements that are just like this one in the human genome. So this coverage is sort of all that coverage here is suspect. I would argue that all that coverage, the coverage actually here is zero, and this would be a homozygous lack of this line insertion in the reference genome. Yeah? So if, if that genome actually had a line element, would you just, would it be able to have really high mass quality, or is there enough of these transposition going on that you never really know if it's a real... It, that's a great question. So if, if this individual was diploid and had both, co both copies had, this individual is diploid, but if both copies had the line element, what would the pattern look like is the question. The pattern would probably look like a mixture of these low quality reads and some high quality reads where the aligner is much more confident that it aligns here. But there's a caveat to that. If this line element is very was re very recently inserted in the human genome, um, and there's a, a couple other copies that are very very identical to that sequence. This this line element, say they're like 
99.99% identical. They differ by one nucleotide. That means that most of the reads that align to this copy or any of those other two copies, it, the aligner is not going to have any idea. The only place where it would have an idea is like the one part in the line element that is different among them. You get probably some confident alignments there, but it would be unconfident around that because it basically it's the exact same sequence. So that, that's why detecting these uh, line element and sign element copy number changes is a bit tricky because of the repetitiveness. And, and a lot of these elements were inserted recently enough in the primate lineage that the molecular clock mutation hasn't had enough time to act upon it to make those different copies diverge from one another. Yeah. Okay, so if there, are, if there are so many copies of a line element, why is there so much sequencing depth at each locus? I couldn't hear the last part. Right. So in this case, the truth is that there was a uh, the lack of this element in this, in this individual that was sequenced. So that's why there's less coverage. Um, but let's, let's, let's imagine sort of a baseline experiment. Take an individual which has exactly the same line element content as the reference genome. Essentially, we sequence the individual that is the reference genome. You're going to get DNA fragments in your sequencing experiment that are sampled from each of the, say, thousand line elements in that individual's genome. And so when you align that DNA back to the reference genome, Essentially, if, even if there's ambiguity about whether a sequence belongs to this copy or that copy or that copy, you could imagine then that DNA is, is equally spread across each of those different copies. And it's, and it's the, and if, so if that's the baseline, if an individual has one of those copies deleted, you're going to have a reduction in the coverage uh, across either all of those line elements or if there's enough information at one of these line elements, you'll be able to attribute that, that reduction in coverage to one particular locus. But I, I think to get at your question, it's hard. I mean, it's not, it's not a, a simple problem to figure that out. Does that answer your question? Well, if, it's, if there's many copies that are absolutely identical, essentially the sequence aligner is, is just rolling a dice. And, and saying, rolling a die and saying, oh, well, there's six copies. I'll just choose one randomly. And But if it's doing that truly randomly, it will be uniformly distributed across all those copies. Yeah? Does the sample draw cells, like, there's probably line elements that aren't in the reference genome? Because yes. Like That's the next slide. Okay. I'll show you that. So these are line elements that are in the reference genome, but not in a sample. but as you probably know, um, retro elements are still somewhat active in the human genome. They're really, really active in Drosophila and in the mouse genome and other model organisms. They're weakly active in the human genome. <coughs> so this one, this is the trickiest of all. So let's say a, a new retro element, an ALU element, has, um, you know, say in, in one of my parents' gametes, there was a spontaneous jumping of an ALU Y element. And the sperm lineage goes through this global demethylation and remethylation and changes the methylation state actually are one of the things that cause retro elements to wake up. So probably, let's say, this, this allo element jumped in um, sperm lineage. And it inserted in this, in this spot in the genome. And one of the, one of the telltale signatures of that is this, this cluster of multicolored alignments and those, each of those colors represent one of the other chromosomes in the human genome. So what this is basically saying is I've got a bunch of alignments that belong here and the other end belongs somewhere else in the genome. And it's just making a guess for each of these alignments among many different locations in the genome. And guess what? Those locations in the other places in the genome coincide with other ALU Y annotations that are on other chromosomes. So this signature is basically saying, I know there's DNA inserted here, and I've got this big 
snarl of alignments that could go anywhere in the genome, but if you actually look closely at them, they belong to LOI elements, so I predict that an LOI ins element inserted in this locus. So there's tools like MELT, and I forget all of them, um, but if you're interested in this stuff, um, uh, Julie Fusier, who did her work with Lynn Jordy, she is like probably the university expert on how to detect these things. All right, so hmm, running out of time here. Wait, what does that say? 10, 50, oh, we got, we're good on time. Sorry, I thought we only had 10 minutes left. Um, so the Thousand Genomes Project, one of the things that they did was look at um, 2,500 individuals. They, they cataloged all the um, single nucleotide variation that's in those genomes. But the other thing they did was look for structural variation. And this is a, a kind of complicated plot. Um, on the x-axis is the size of the structural variants that they detected. Um, and y-axis is how many variants of that size did they detect. And then the colors are how many variants of that size and type did they detect. Okay, so a couple of things. Um, one of the things we see is that the smallest, the smallest event they detected was maybe like 50 base pairs. And for deletions, there's this relatively uniform distribution across different sizes, but when you get out to really big deletions, they become less and less common. There aren't that many of them. And why would that be? Why do you think really big deletions might be less common? Yeah. Right, they're, they're likely to be bad and probably under purifying selection. Um, this, is, this is a bit outdated. If you looked at a more updated plot that had better technology, we would see that as we get smaller and smaller, there's more and more deletions that are small, and it's, that's following that same intuition. Um, small deletions probably don't affect genes, and so therefore are more tolerated and probably exist more in the human genome. Couple things to point out. One, there's this spike of uh, insertions at around 600 base pairs, and it turns out that that's all the polymorphic alu Y insertions in the human genome. Big spike there. And then there's another spike at about 6 KB, which is novel line element insertions, which are polymorphic and still active in the human genome. Um, but the basic take home here is that there's lots of copy number variants, structural variants in any human genome, ranging from 100 base pairs all the way up to, you know, 100 KB. And I would guess if I sequence my genome, um, there's going to be lots and lots of deletions and duplications that are, you know, at least 10 KB, maybe even 100 KB, and for me, maybe even a megabase, who knows. Right, so how do we go about doing this? Let's now get into the real details of methods, and it help. I think it'll help you think through um, some of the challenges and, and how this might work. So there are four different approaches to finding structural variation from sequencing data. One we've already looked at, which is depth of coverage. You basically, you know, imagine you open up IGV and the caller is basically just scrolling through the genome and just looking for situations where the coverage was normal, then all of a sudden it drops, and then all of a sudden it returns to normal again suggesting that there's um, you know, a deletion in the interstitial region. That's one signal. I'll show you in a little bit that, that that's a bit of a crude signal and can be challenging. We can also use paired end sequencing or paired end mapping. So the, uh, the idea, as I mentioned before, is that if we assume that most of the molecules that we sequence were, say, 500 base pairs, then we expect when the ends of those molecules are aligned to the reference genome, typically they are 500 base pairs apart. So when they are much farther or much closer than 500 base pairs, that's indicative of some sort of rearrangement or difference in the structure of that individual's genome. If the actual sequence, so the two ends, if one of the two ends actually contains that novel junction, the, the novel junction of DNA that arises when you have a duplication or deletion, when that happens, we get these split alignments. This is sort of almost the ideal. If we have these split alignments, that gives us single nucleotide resolution as to where a potential uh, structural difference might be or where the breakpoint might be. The ideal, the best case scenario, which we really can't do today feasibly, um, would be to assemble 
take all the sequencing data that we got from an individual and um, almost like build the jigsaw puzzle by the overlaps of all those pieces so that we build that individual's puzzle, complete chromosome sequences assembled from the raw data, and then all we do is we, we would go back, if we could do that, we could go back to the Jeff Bailey and Evan Eichler experiment and just do a dot plot of my chromosome 6 to the reference genome's chromosome 6 and all the structural variants would just fall out in that dot plot. Unfortunately, we can't do that because the human genome is so repetitive that with Illumina sequences, it's just those puzzle pieces aren't big enough to stitch together that, to, to assemble that puzzle. Um, and, and, and also the other part is we'd want a diploid assembly. We'd actually want two, two genomes to be assembled, our, our maternal genome and our paternal genome. So long read sequencing technologies like PacBio and Oxford Nanopore, um, they have some promise for doing this and actually this has been done a couple of times. Uh, at great expense and great computational challenge. But I think as the expense of these long read sequences, sequencers come down, um, I would guess five, ten years from now, we will be able to um, possibly sequence or de novo assemble the majority of the human genome and do that experiment. Okay, so depth of coverage. So this is a zooming out uh, to a 27 KB locus in IGV of, of um, two genomes. One, the genome of, uh, a can from blood from a cancer patient. And two, DNA, the genome from a tumor from that same patient. And what you can see is that in the, in the normal, it's pretty flat in the blood from, the, from that patient. The coverage is flat. And then all of a sudden, there's this excess of DNA in the tumor genome, suggesting that there's a big duplication. And we can see this by eye. Right? I mean, if you, if you could spend the week scrolling through every chromosome in IGV at this resolution and just tagging off duplications and deletions, you'd be able to see this no problem. But we want to be able to automate this process. No one, no one's, people would quit their job in a, in a half a day if they had to do that experiment, right? So we want to be able to find this signal, duplication, reductions or increases in coverage that, that reflect copy number changes. That signal is confounded by noise. That noise is that there is intrinsic variability in coverage along chromosomes that are driven by things that are not copy number variation. So we could have just some parts of the genome we know might be more difficult to align to, right? Um, and therefore, we might have decreases in coverage, I think to your point, that um, really have nothing to do with a deletion. It's just like harder to align things there, so the coverage looks lower. We can also, we also know that the human reference genome is, is incomplete. We don't, we don't actually have a full reference genome. So there could be, and there are, loci in the genome that are where, let's say, every, pretty much everyone on Earth has three copies of a gene, but the reference genome, because of the way it was assembled, only has two. So no matter who you sequence, it's going to look like there's a duplication because we really have, humans really have three copies, but the reference genome only has two. So you'd get this increase of coverage in everybody. And if you see it in everybody, it's probably not a copy number variant, it's probably a, an error with a reference genome, and we see that all the time. Yeah? Is the reference genome always diploid? It's, it's inherently haploid. Oh. So it's, it, and that's one of the limitations, is that you know we only get one sequence for chromosome one, and that's essentially a consensus of the DNA from the individuals that were studied to create the reference genome. So it doesn't count for like common uh, DNAs? No, not at all, actually. But we, we have to use the reference genome as essentially the guide to tell us where there are differences in other individuals to detect CMVs, okay? All right, so this problem is this, the biggest source, source of noise um, for using depth of coverage to find CNVs was actually in the early days, and it's still uh, the case today to some degree, is variability in GC content. So um, let, me, let me dig into that a little bit. So let's imagine the following experiment to detect CNVs. We take a whole genome sequencing data set, we align it to the reference genome, and we get a BAM file, right? So what we can do is just break up the genome into windows. We can say, all right, we're going to study all the sequence alignments in the first 10,000 base pairs of chromosome 1. 
all the sequence alignments in the second 10,000 base pairs, third, fourth, etc. right? And for each of those windows or chunks of the genome, we can just count how many sequencing reads were there. And if we look at all those windows on average, we, get a, we can get a mean depth or mean number of reads that are observed for each of those, um, for each of those windows. Um, and if we, if we have a mean, we, to calculate a mean, we really have a distribution. There's a distribution of depths observed across all those 10,000 um, windows. And I can tell you that that distribution usually looks like a normal distribution, a bell curve. So the mean is really the center of that uh, normal distribution. And so what we can do is then convert this, each window's depth, into the number of standard deviations that that depth has with respect to the mean of all the depths from all the distributions. And the number of standard deviations away from the mean is also known as the z-score. So if you're two standard deviations above the mean, your z-score is two. If you're fifth, 10 standard deviations below the mean, your z-score is 10. So what this plot is, is essentially each blue point is a window is a 10 kb window. I actually don't know. I think it was 2 kb in this case. And what's plotted on the y-axis is the z-score. How different is the depth observed from that in that window from the mean? And you can see that by and large, pretty much everything is at z-score of zero, which is which means it's very close to the mean. And if we assume that the mean depth represents diploid, most of the genome looks diploid. But all of a sudden, there's there's this drop. Um, for this last chromosome, and that is chromosome X. So what's the sex of this individual on top? Hmm? Male, yep, boy, I like that one. Um, because there's a drop in coverage, there's only one X chromosome, so the drop is, is ref the Z-score drop reflects haploid versus diploid, okay? Um, now, when we zoom in, so in this, this is, say, a tumor genome for the same individual, and you can see there's copy number changes all over the place where the depth of coverage, most of it's diploid, but here's some mangled region where there's copy number variation all over the place. And then if you zoom in on a particular locus, um, this is a 15 megabate, uh, megabyte, megabase region um, of some chromosome that doesn't matter. But what we can see here is, you know, pretty much every point is on z-score equals zero, which means it's equivalent to the mean. But we can see these very fine scale um, potential duplications and potential deep deletions. And the challenge here is deciding whether or not, well, is that one dot, one window that went up, is that really a duplication? Or is that just noise in sequence in the variability randomness in the sequencing coverage for that 10 kb region? Um, and so the size of the window that you choose governs sort of how noisy that's going to look. You imagine if you did really big windows, sort of that local variation or randomness in coverage is going to wash out. So that's good. But the downside of choosing really big windows is by definition, your resolution to detect things is, is very low. If your window size is one megabase, you really can't find deletions that are, say, 50 kilobases, right? So there's this trade-off of how big of a window do you choose so that you minimize noise um, at, the co at the consequence of reducing your power to detect things. Okay, so the other problem is that GC content varies dramatically along the genome. So this is a slide from a, one of the first lectures in the class, and it's kind of the same experiment. But in this case, I'm not counting sequencing reads. I'm, I've broken the w genome up into windows, and I'm just measuring what fraction of the nucleotides in that window are Gs or Cs, and that's the GC content. And what you can see is that there is variability quite a bit. And I mean, you know, this is going from as low as 30% GC content up to, say, 50% GC content. Okay. So there's variability along GC con uh, as a function of GC content. Um, and if you've done PCR, you probably know something about a problem with, with GC content. What does is, what is really high GC content lead to with PCR? Anyone know? It's harder to amplify because there's, uh, there's stronger bonds between Gs and Cs, so it's harder to denature 
high GC content DNA. So there tends to be a bias against high GC content. And the same kind of thing manifests in sequencing because we have to use C PCR. So there is a bit of a bias against really high GC content sequence. All right, so let's, let's um, here's a plot that um, I made a long time ago. I'm sort of embarrassed by it, but it doesn't look very pretty. But the information content is pretty good, I think. So on the top plot, we're looking at the same region on chromosome 17 from megabase 3 to megabase 15. And on the top plot is the number of reads, sequence alignments, observed for each of these windows. Okay, So you can see there's fluctuation. But if you notice, if I plot for the same windows in red dots, the GC content, by and large, that fluctuation in depth, the number of sequences observed for each of these windows, tracks with GC content. Um, so, except for maybe this region. So the idea is that we actually want to normalize our sequencing coverage, the observations for each uh, window, by the GC content of that window. Uh, so the way we went about doing this, um, I'm just to kind of breeze through this, but the idea is you take, you don't treat every window the same. You look at all the, say, 5 kb windows in the genome, and you calculate the GC content for each of those 5 kb windows. Um, let's maybe say we look at all the windows that have 35% GC content, say in blue, all the windows that have 40% GC content, all the windows that have 45% GC content, and then we build up these distributions of the depth observed for each of those windows with those different GC contents. And what you can see is that the mean depth of, of windows with 40% GC content is higher than windows with 45% GC content. So somewhat confusingly, the, the, the way it works in sequencing is higher GC content actually leads to increased coverage, which is sort of the opposite of what I was explaining with PCR. Um, I forget the details of why. Um, and if it has the lowest GC content, the read depth is different. So those z-scores now are not from the overall coverage distribution, but we can do this, calculate individual G GC scores, or z-scores, sorry, based upon the GC content of each window. So that's, that, that was an important advance in being able to detect copy number variation from depth of coverage. And if we do that now, we can normalize that, that coverage based upon GC content, and a lot of this fluctuation goes away because we've kind of subtracted out or washed out the variability in GC content. And what you're left with are things that are potentially real. Like, for instance, this big duplication at the end, you can see that that's way and above the tracking with the GC content. So that's possibly a real du uh, duplication. Okay? Um, so we can use this approach, even just plots like this, um, to, to, to see obvious copy number variation based upon depth of coverage in tumor genomes. Um, so here's, again, blood from the patient, primary tumor, and then uh, DNA from a biopsy of the relapsed uh, or the metastatic version of the tumor. And what you can see is, obviously, the, the, the primary tumor is, is pretty aneuploid. Um, and then the metast metastatic tumor is just all over the place. Um, and this, this is really the challenge in, in sort of interpreting um, the biology of a tumor genome because it's just so complicated and rearranged. Um, you know, which of these events might actually be driving proliferation or are all of these events really the consequence of just genome instability and constant proliferation, it just doesn't matter. So the, you know, w what is causal and what is um, uh, a consequence of other mechanisms is an open question in this area. But you can see in the, in the, in the data that there's obvious copy number variation in these genomes. Okay, so the next thing I want to cover is a, is a higher resolution approach um, using paired end sequencing. So I've talked about this before, but I think this slide helps. Let's imagine we took all of the paired end sequences that we got from our experiment. And we, we looked at the BAM file. Remember in the BAM file, there's that insert size? That insert size tells us essentially the distance between the two ends. If we used sonication or 
um, you know, pass DNA through some small aperture gemstone such that we were shooting for 500 base pair molecules or say 250 base pair molecules in this case, we would expect the distribution of those insert sizes in the BAM file to look something like this, where the mean is roughly the, the fragment size that we were going after, but you know, some of those molecules are going to be a little bit larger, some are going to be a little bit smaller. This is actual data. This is an actual insert size distribution from a paired end sequencing experiment. So the idea is, as I said, um, if that's the case, then when you take paired end sequences and, and look at their distance in the reference genome, we expect them to be that far apart, on average 250 base pairs. So when we see a situation like this, where this end and this end align, say, 2,250 base pairs apart, that suggests, because the mean is 250, that, that this distance <clears throat> differs from the mean by 2,000 base pairs, suggesting that maybe there was a 2,000 base pair deletion in this individual. Now, one observation like that is not enough, because we could have chimeric molecules or just something might just have gone wrong with that sequence. But if we start seeing multiple sequence alignments at the same locus that have the same alignment distance apart, that's really starting to mount our um, confidence, increase our confidence, rather, that this is a real rearrangement. Okay? So it's really just that comparing this distance to the empirical distribution of those distances for the sample that you sequence. And that's effectively what all structural variant callers are doing. They're looking at depth of coverage and they're looking at these types of signals to figure out, do I believe this signal or is this junk noise? Okay. Um, this was a challenge in the early days because of chimeric molecules because ligase was added to sequencing uh, uh, DNA sequences to, to ligate adapters so you could put it on the flow cell. Nowadays, we use transposase to do that. Um, there's no ligase, so chimeric molecules are less of an issue. Um, this gets back to the signatures, the, the DNA gymnastics that I showed in the other slide, but these paired end molecules can be used to find all sorts of rearrangements. I showed you an example of a deletion. Um, this is the, the null case where there is no structural variation. We, you know, the distance is, uh, is as far apart as we expect. But if there are rearrangements, we get all these wild patterns. Um, being able to understand all those patterns doesn't really matter. But the point is, there are known patterns for each type of rearrangement that we can try to detect. Same thing for split alignments. Now, now imagine that the actual sequence at one end or the other has harbors the breakpoint. So the breakpoint is right here. Um, when we align to the reference genome, which has B, my genome doesn't. Um, we're going to get alignments upstream and downstream. And the same thing happens. We get the same sort of scars in the DNA um, for all types of other rearrangements. And these, these, when the sequence itself that we got off the machine in the FASTQ file hat contains that breakpoint, the alignments to the reference genome will recapitulate that, the re rearrangement that occurred. Um, so when we, and that's really important because if we can use, if we can use split reads, we can get uh, we can map breakpoints to single base pair resolution, and when we can know the breakpoint at single base pair resolution, we can start to infer things about the mechanism. Um, we can look for scars indicated by uh, retrotransposition. There's something called target site duplication when a, when a retro element inserts. We can look for that. Um, when, there's, when the deletion was caused by non-homologous end joining, um, the name implies that there's no homology, non-homologous, at the breakpoint. So you can look at the breakpoint to see, is there homology there? Um, and really for NHEJ, we expect sort of like one to three base pairs of homology at most. Um, so we can, we can really scrutinize these breakpoints with split reads to figure out what caused it, if you care about that stuff. Um, so I just want to touch upon uh, a method that we developed uh, called Lumpy. This was developed by um, a student and postdoc in my lab named Ryan, who's now at the University of Colorado Boulder. Um, and it basically integrates all these different signals. And the big advance for Lumpy um, is that it integrates all like copy uh, depth of coverage, these split reads, these paired ends in, into one probabilistic framework and allows us to uh, make better predictions of structural variance with higher accuracy. So here's an example of uh, a call made by Lumpy in a 1,000 Genomes Project individual. 
It's predicting a 2,573 base pair deletion. And what I just want to point out is the signals that went into this. So these are split read alignments that sort of coincide with the predicted breakpoint. There's a reduction in coverage here. And then these are these discordant alignments where one end is aligning much farther away than the other. So essentially it's all this information that gets put into the framework and the output is this prediction that there's a deletion from here to here. And you know, when you see an example like this, it seems like an easy problem. The challenge is to find these types of arrangements that are real in the face of a lot of noise in, the, in, in sequence alignments that sort of look like um, potential structural variants, but are actually just complexity in the alignment that comes from the fact that the human genome is repetitive and incomplete. Um, so so we, I don't need to go into too much detail here, but this is an argument about how sensitive and specific Lumpy is. So if you're, if you're looking, if you're interested in structural variation, or you're doing this in any of your research, reach out to me. This slide's a bit dated. Lumpy, Manta, um, Delhi, there's a few other programs out there. They're useful for any organism, um, they're not just human. Um, and if you're interested in that, let me know. I can, I can help you get set up running those tools. That's something we do day in, day out. So um, in the last five minutes, I just want to go over sort of the dirty laundry of, of um, trying to discover and characterize these, these structural changes in, in, in genomes. I've touched upon this many times. There are lots of possibilities for false positives because of the incomplete nature of the reference genome, chimeras, um, we have short reads, and the human genome is repetitive. So the reality is, even though I say that a typical genome has like three, five, ten thousand structural variants, these tools predict something like a hundred thousand. So the challenge is how do you winnow down the hundred thousand predictions to the to the five or ten that are actually real? And that that leads to filtering. Essentially what we end up doing is applying filters with things like basically commands like awk and things that we've we've talked about um, to subset those hundred thousand predictions to, to those that are the highest confidence. And the things that are the highest confidence are the, the structural variant predictions that have say the most pieces of alignment evidence. So we believe we have there's more observations so we're more confident in it. Okay, so that's, that's, I think, a sane strategy to reduce false positives, but you know, trying to improve the accuracy of these kind of predictions in anything in genomics is a tug of war. Because any time you're trying to reduce false positives, as a consequence, you increase false negatives. That is, things that are real that you miss because of those filtering steps. And so that's the other dirty secret is false negative rate is also very high. So in a nutshell, structural variation is hard. It's hard to find these things with high accuracy um, because, the, because the alignments are so difficult and structural variants tend to manifest in repetitive parts of the genome. We just don't do as good a job with short read sequencing data as we do with SNPs. Um, so ultimately, I don't need to belabor these points. Um, the false negative rate is high. The false positive rate is high. Accuracy is low. Um, it's a hard problem. Despite, and that's uh, I think a, a current challenge for the field because we know uh, that these types of rearrangements or these types of genetic variation actually are really essential for understanding um, human disease and, and other phenotypes in any organism. So we want to do a better job. Okay, so I'll stop there for today. Please let me know uh, today if you have any more problems with permissions or anything like that with the homework folder. I think I've gotten everything right. I apologize for the problems, but um, just let me know. Thank you.